When I said that, uh, however improbable the origin of life might be, even if this is the only planet in the universe that has life, I was invoking the anthropic principle. I was invoking the idea that because we are here, we are alive, we are thinking about it, then however improbable the origin of life was, however improbable the origin of intelligence was, it has to have happened at least once because here we are thinking about it. That I find actually a rather satisfying account. I don't believe it because I think that life is much more improbable than that. But even if we are the only planet in the universe that has life, I myself am satisfied by the, by the anthropic principle for accounting for the fact that we have life here. That's the planetary version of the anthropic principle. There is a cosmic version of the anthropic principle, which is, for some bizarre reason that I've never understood, often invoked by religious apologists, who apparently don't understand that far from being a theistic argument, it is a profoundly atheistic argument. Some physicists have suggested that the universe, the laws of physics, the fundamental constants of physics, are fine-tuned in such a way as to bring us into existence. We have a message from outer space coming in. <laughs> there are physicists who will tell you that if you take about um, half a dozen physical constants, these are constants that physicists have no explanation for, they just accept that these numbers have the values that they do, and they then do theoretical calculations using their models to say if any one of these half dozen uh, constants was ever so slightly varied, then the universe as we know it would not be possible. Uh, for example, if the gravitational constant was a little bit different, there would be no stars, there would be no galaxies, uh, the entire universe would just be a uniform splurge of hydrogen, for example. You wouldn't have stars, you wouldn't have chemistry, you wouldn't have the formation of the, of the heavier elements, you couldn't have life. And they do the same trick for uh, half a dozen other physical constants. A good example is Martin Rees, the present Astronomer Royal, in his book, Just Six Numbers. If the universe, if constants of the universe are indeed fine-tuned, how do we explain it? How do we explain the appearance that the universe is tuned to bring us into existence. Well, theists say God did it. Uh, God tuned, God twiddled the knobs and tuned the physical constants to have exactly the right values. That, of course, is no explanation at all because it leaves unexplained the tuner. It's just pushing the, the problem back one step. So we can instantly discount explanation number one. Explanation number two is adopted by physicists, I think, Steven Weinberg, who was quoted earlier in this conference. Uh, Steven Weinberg, <coughs> Nobel Prize winning physicist from Texas, um, I think his view is that we don't yet understand enough physics, and when we do, when we have the longed for theory of everything, the TOE, we will then realize that these knobs are not for tuning. There is no freedom, there are no degrees of freedom. Uh, there's only one way for a universe to be. But that might leave some people unsatisfied because it still seems a bit uncanny that the only way for a universe to be is the way that eventually gave rise to us. The third explanation is, I think, the one that's probably favored by... Oh, no, there are four, actually. Um, Victor Stenger, who will be known to and greatly respected by many people here, um, denies that the, that the universe is fine-tuned at all. And that's a serious point of view that we, that we ought to not forget. But assuming that it is fine-tuned, um, the final idea, which I think probably most physicists um, at least have some time for, is the multiverse theory. This is a theory that arises out of the inflationary model of the universe, and it suggests that uh, the, the universe that we know, the only universe of which we have any knowledge or any means of measuring, is a bubble in a foam of billions of bubbles, each one a separate universe, 
Does that mean? Uh, each one a separate universe, and each one having a different set of physical laws and constants. So there's a vast range of universes with different laws and constants. A tiny minority of those universes have their constants tuned in such a way that the universe lasts more than a picosecond, lasts long enough to make galaxies, lasts long enough to make stars, long enough to make chemistry, and to, make, and to let the evolution of life happen. A tiny minority of universes in this bubbling foam have what it takes, and then the anthropic principle kicks in. Of that foaming bubble of all those, all those bubbles in the foam of the multiverse, we have to be living in one of the minority of universes that has what it takes to give rise to us because we are here. Once again, physicists find that a, a bit of a stretch. They find it not exactly implausible, but they think of it as a bit of a cop-out. I actually think it's rather an elegant explanation, um, and uh, it's, I, I, I think it's probably true, but I don't know enough physics to, to know. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll just go on to the final um, science fiction speculation that uh, it, it's kind of rounding off this theme of the theological implications of science fiction. Another science fiction theme um, explored by Daniel Galloy, who is another of my favorite science fiction authors in um, his third book. I can't remember the title, sorry. Um, his, his, his idea, and it's been used by others as well, is that our world may be a gigantic computer simulation in a computer elsewhere in the, in the universe. We are virtual creatures. We're living in a virtual world. Um, as kind of second life, uh, but a much bigger and better, grander second life. Um, I don't know whether you can rule that out. It may be philosophically absurd, but even if, it's, even if it were true, once again we would have the regress. You cannot have complexity, you cannot have a sort of complexity to build a computer, to build a second life software to run us unless the creatures that built that computer evolved. Maybe they're also somebody else's second life, but sooner or later regresses of that kind have to be terminated. You cannot suddenly invent complexity and intelligence. The only way to do it is to start from primeval simplicity and work up gradually. Darwin discovered one way in which you can go from primeval simplicity to prodigies of complexity, and who knows where that might end. There may be other ways. I, obviously, I can't imagine what they would be, or I would have won the Nobel Prize for suggesting them. But um, whatever they are, they are going to be like Darwinism, in that they are going to build progressively on primeval simplicity and work up gradually to the sort of complexity that's capable of living, that's capable of thinking, that's capable of building rockets that can go to other star systems, or that's capable of building a computer to simulate life. <laughs>